Hi everyone, I decided that I absolutely could not abide seeing my face for 40 minutes, so I decided to do this as a video. I hope this will be okay for everyone. The slide behind you more or less gives you my life story. Um, but what is pertinent is that I did my doctoral thesis on the perceptions of a leadership crisis in the early years sector. However, I've been absolutely floored about being able to refer our current crisis situation to most of my research. And this has triggered an interest in how crises develop in general and are sustained. I'm looking forward to the next chapter of my life with some trepidation, but also with excitement. The UN Convention on the Rights of the Child has 54 articles in total, but today we're going to focus on four articles in the Convention that are seen as special. They're known as the General Principles, and they help to interpret all the other articles. They also have a key role in how the rights of a child plays out in reality. Children up to 18 years old are considered as rights holders or for the purposes of this presentation, they are bearers of equal rights and active participants in realising their rights. Duty bearers have a responsibility to uphold children's rights and to fulfil their obligations to the children in their care. Rights are defined as the basic legal, social or ethical entitlements of any human being, including children, and therefore are extremely important to the well-being of everyone. So a rights-based educational approach should begin with these very basic elements. Children have the right to be heard, they have the right to a childhood, they have the right to be educated, they have the right to be healthy, and they have the right to be treated fairly. We will develop on these principles a bit more as we go through this presentation. It is necessary to draw a distinction between a needs-based approach and a rights-based approach in the development of public policies and in how our policies are developed and implemented in our schools. A needs-based approach is aimed at solving specific problems that need our immediate attention which unfortunately allows for the perception of our citizens as passive subjects who are only considered from the standpoint of their problems. A rights-based approach, however, fosters a vision of citizenship and citizens are then holders of rights irrespective of their circumstances and are active participants in the way their lives unfold. This slide expands on the obligations of educators as duty bearers and I will, I'll leave you to have a look at that more closely. However, the point that stands out the most for me is the point that says motivation, commitment and acceptance of duty. That is the precursor for how we do what we do and why we do what we do. This human rights values framework is a starting point for developing a rights-based educational ethos in any school. First of all, it looks at how we ourselves become educated about rights and how we standardize that understanding within our school environment. Then it looks at a learning environment that encapsulates rights as, a, as the basis of um, the educational delivery and then it looks at how we as responsible citizens put that out into our wider environment locally and globally. The ultimate goal in developing a rights-based educational approach is to contribute to an open and democratic society. 
Therefore, the participation of families and communities in promoting the child as a rights bearer is key to the success of this venture. Our starting point has got to be the individual child. Do we in our schools have the structures in place to actually see children as individuals or have they inadvertently become a commodity for the success of the school due to external pressures? Is there a way for us to meet these pressures and not lose sight of the child as an individual? Time, space and attitudes are key elements in the development of a rights-based educational approach. Time, space and attitudes are affected by place and process. Do our schools truly value children as bearers of equal rights? This is a key question in the implementation of a rights-based educational approach, which will be dependent on how time, space, attitude, place and process coalesce to nurture the right environment for a rights-based education in our schools. During the next three slides, I will ask some questions to help to audit the elements of time, space and attitudes within schools. So let's start with time. How can you as school leaders ensure the development of a rights-based education approach is a priority in your school? Are your schools structured to enable for building and embedding a rights-based educational approach? Are your school leaders, teachers and all your staff overwhelmed by other demands on their roles to truly commit to a rights-based educational approach? In consulting with staff, are there changes that could be made to ensure that time is given to developing a rights-based educational approach? Moving on to space. Will it be possible to create spaces to accommodate for children with unique and special rights? Can the distribution of space within your schools be repurposed as an integral aspect of planning for the rights of children? Can your policies be reviewed and reshaped by the child as bearer of equal rights? Are policies within your school generally viewed as tick box exercises to visually portray the school as meeting legislative requirements or are policies generally implemented as a meaningful ethos within your school? Moving on to attitudes. Do school leaders actively create safe spaces within their schools for everyone to discuss their beliefs and values? Do school leaders and staff understand how their attitudes are developed and how they can be changed if necessary? Do school leaders and staff understand how their attitudes impact on policy development and policy implementation? Would you say that all children are treated equally in your school? What does that look like? What is your unconscious bias and how is it playing out in your classroom and in the wider environs of the school? How can you find out if this is having a negative effect on children and parents? Do children need equal treatment or equity to claim their rights? Personally, I believe far more in equity rather than trying to create a scenario of equality that does not truly value the individual child. This is what equity looks like. This is the result of care, observation, self-reflection, emotional literacy and teachers and staff who are crazy about children. Educational theorist Yuri Bronfenbrenner passionately advocates for adults who are crazy about children. 
School leaders, teachers and staff hold the makings of either a healthy ecology or a high-risk ecology for children and the wider society. Equity is therefore a key element of the child as bearer of equal rights. Let's revisit the general principles. I think the top two principles would have a vigorous head nod from almost all educators. These are the principles of the best interest of the child and the right to life, survival and development. However, the bottom two are far more complex. How do we ensure that all children in schools are heard? Even the children who are elective moots. What do schools have in place for children who are in danger of being invisible? There are a number of children within our schools that are wandering around in our environments, unseen and unheard. And if we're not careful, we miss hearing their voices, even for a whole school year. That is very possible. Are practitioners emotionally aware, aware enough to understand if they're hearing a child that is from the non-majority population and of a different race to themselves as educators? What about a child with physical disabilities? How about mental health issues? Are we clued up enough on non-discriminatory practice? How do you ensure that your unconscious bias does not impact on children? All of us have prejudices and it is important that we use self-reflection to ensure that our prejudices do not impact negatively on the children that come through our classrooms. My husband is 15 years older than me and his first language was Dutch. In an English school, he has never forgotten the nursery class teacher that made him feel tiny and small and insignificant. He has never forgotten her and he's 75 years old. We have a lifelong impact on anybody that comes through our schools. I'm going to share a poem with you that I wrote called The Underlying Fact. The poem will challenge you and whilst I do not apologise for challenging you, I do hope you take it in the spirit that it's intended. Oh, I forgot to mention there is a colourful word in it, just one. And it's not too bad, I hope. So here goes. The Underlying Fact by Valerie Daniel. The underlying fact is that I'm white. And that fact alone gives me the right to be better than these people. And this they should know. Because a fact is a fact, isn't it though? My whole life is based on this underlying fact. It sustained me for years, a kind of unwritten pact between like-minded people who know what they know, because a fact is a fact, isn't it though? Here's some other facts I know. These people are not very bright. They're aggressive and violent and ready to fight, but give them their due. They're good at music and athletics. They've been brought here to entertain us and work on our buses. It's the way things are and this I know because a fact is a fact, isn't it though? So tell me what's happening. My world is upside down. I know square pegs can't fit in holes that are round. Where did they get the ability to acquire positions of authority? Who taught them to teach and aspire to reach places meant for me and mine? What's this world coming to? They've crossed the line. While I was basking in the glow of the underlying fact, it seems the bastards crept up behind me and overtook me from the back. In my anger and fury, I asked old father time, what are you doing? Have you lost your mind? 
Well, old father time, he laughed. His belly shook with mirth. He said, your underlying fact, my dear, is an accident of birth. The issue was never the colour of your skin, but what you did with the situation you're in. People have always been people despite their plight, with equal ability, intellect and rights. What you deluded yourself with was never a fact, just the man's ability to obscure reality, and that is simply that. Never base your life on the underlying fact, because when it is, in, is challenged, nothing stays intact. Life is multilayered with all kinds of truths and dimensions, twists and turns in many directions. So live and let live and keep an open mind. Be sincere and honest and try to be kind. Build your life on ideals that make an impact because equality is engraved in our destiny. And that is that. I am more than happy for you to ask me anything about this poem uh, in our question section. And I, I do hope that you will ask. But in the meanwhile, um, I'm challenging us to look at some of the perceptions we have subsumed into our psyche over the years. This is not a black white thing. It is in fact, a very general perception that all people have of, um, I would say, some of our non-majority population. Um, I'm asking for us to have a couple of conversations about some of these um, perceptions, and I know it's uncomfortable. But until we can have dialogue about these issues, we will never have change. We will never be able to meaningfully implement a rights-based approach in our schools. And we desperately need it. I thank you all for listening. And I do hope this has challenged you in some way. Thank you.